I think we should start off with the commissioner uh, and he can start us. And as we get into more specifics, we can have questions and we have the entire morning devoted to this. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for the record, Michael Harrington, Commissioner of Vermont Department of Labor. We also have uh, Cameron Wood, our UI director, as well as Matthew Barowitz, who's our Economic and Labor Market Information uh, Director or Chief Economist. Um, so each of them can speak uh, to their respective areas. Appreciate uh, seeing you all in uh, 2022. Um, although I think we've stayed in pretty regular uh, contact even uh, after the session ended uh, last year. Um, so we can certainly give uh, an overview of the department um, if, if you'd like, but maybe to the point uh, you just ended with uh, Mr. Chair um, in terms of looking at COVID, uh, which seems to be the most um, prominent or um, uh, urgent area that we face uh, right now. I think um, we would also agree that workforce is uh, one of, if not our top priority going forward, given the workforce uh, shortage that we and every other state are experiencing. Um, at this point, uh, we don't believe there's necessarily um, directed or specific uh, um, legislation that's needed for the department or the state to um, you know, further combat uh, the COVID crisis from um, uh, maybe the Department of Labor's perspective. That said, I think we're all familiar with um, the OSHA uh, emergency temporary standard that's currently moving through the court system. So we are keenly aware of that. Um, that's the requirement uh, from the federal government that employers larger than 100 um, must, ha must have either a, a vaccination policy in place or require uh, their um, employees to be tested on a weekly basis uh, and report and maintain those test results. Um, I think we have some, some varying opinions on, on that. From our perspective, uh, we're what's known as um, a state plan state. So um, some states, uh, OSHA actually oversees um, enforcement in their states. I think there's roughly about 23 states that are state plan states. Um, we're one of them. Uh, so uh, really what that does is um, shift uh, the responsibility onto us and the Vermont Occupational Safety and Health uh, Administration or VOSHA. Uh, and uh, we will need to, if uh, this moves forward and doesn't um, get stalled out again in the court system, uh, look to implement some type of an emergency rule that is as effective as uh, the emergency temporary standard. So um, I think we have uh, some thoughts on how to go about doing that without overburdening uh, Vermont's small employers. Um, I think we would we would say to, to Senator Clarkson's comment earlier, um, you know, small employers in Vermont are very different than small employers in other, other states. So um, figuring out how to be mindful of that. Um, from the unemployment insurance perspective, um, we are uh, at, I guess, what we would call pre-pandemic levels for people collecting unemployment. Um, I think what makes uh, this time now uh, different from when we enacted provisions um, early on to expand eligibility um, and um, either additional benefits or uh, additional um, supports for employers is that um, now we have a vaccine and we also have boosters um, and those vaccines um, cover a wide um, age range um, from, from toddler and, and young adult to um, adult. So uh, from that perspective, uh, there are many more opportunities um, uh, for protection uh, with our worker community. I think also what we're finding is that more employers have now adjusted their, um, their work habits uh, so that there's more flexibility, um, there's more ability for people to work remote um, or have um, uh, you know, changes in shift coverage. Um, so again, I think there's a lot more opportunity there. Or if someone um, finds that their current employment is not conducive to their, um, you know, uh, their other responsibilities in their personal life, um, they also have a lot of options as well in terms of uh, moving around the employment system. So they could find easily another employer that may offer more flexibilities, um, you know, if they needed to manage childcare uh, or things of that nature. Um, 
Uh, Matt uh, is here as well, and, and Matt can certainly talk about the employment landscape uh, in terms of um, what it looks like in terms of uh, how Vermont's labor force has decreased over the past two years, um, but also what um, what hiring looks like in our uh Work, workforce landscape. Um, so happy to go in whatever direction uh, the committee would like, uh, or I can just keep talking. I, thank you very much for that. That's a good uh, uh, starting point. Uh, I'd like to stay on the COVID thing and let's get through that issue uh, first and then we can go more into the other issues. Uh, and maybe uh, one of the things I'd be curious is to hear from Cameron. What, tell us what the, if somebody comes in with saying, I came down with COVID and, and we can talk about whether it makes a difference, whether they're vaccinated or not. And the doctor says, you got, you got to take three weeks off and isolate yourself or something like that. And the person says, well, um, I got laid off either temporarily or permanently as a result of that. And he goes to, to you and says, I'd like to draw on employment. What, is, what happens to that person? Yes, sir. Uh, good morning. Uh, for the record, Cameron Wood, Unemployment Insurance and Wages Division Director for the Department of Labor. Happy to try to address uh, the question, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, as a general matter, the first thing we'll look at is whether or not someone has separated from employment. And in the event, I, we actually did a webinar just yesterday for a lot of employers regarding vaccine mandates and unemployment insurance and the impacts of a vaccine mandate on a, a potential separation and whether those individuals would be eligible. And I spoke a little bit about this topic. If an individual has been asked to quarantine or is out sick due to contracting COVID-19, and they have an anticipation of going back to work. So, you know, they have a job available. They will be going back to that job after that period of quarantine or illness. Uh, we would likely not consider that to be a separation from employment in that instance, and the individual would not be eligible for unemployment. If there has been a separation because somebody is out due to, you know, being sick, uh, the individual, if it's COVID related, would likely not be eligible for unemployment at this point during that period, because a requirement to receive unemployment is that you be able to work, available to work, and actively seeking work. And somebody who has separated because they're not able to work because of COVID, whether they're sick or they are being asked to quarantine, would not be eligible for unemployment at that time because they would not be able to work because of that reason. If there is a separation because of COVID, so let's say, you know, somebody contracts COVID, they're being asked to quarantine, their employer says, no, you need to come to work. Um, and, and there's a separation there, let's say the person doesn't show up and they're terminated, or the employer just chooses to terminate, you know, you're going to be out for too long, I need to have somebody here, you know, we're not going to bring you back. In that instance, we would look at that and say, after the period of, of illness, we would look at the separation and determine uh, that person most likely to be eligible. Uh, you can't, you know, if somebody has to quit a job or somebody refuses to go into work because it would be contrary to guidance provided to them by a healthcare provider or the CDC. So, you know, the health department's telling somebody to quarantine for five days, the employer's telling them you're asymptomatic, you need to come to work, and the person refuses and quits. Um, you know, we would probably consider that good cause to quit. And, and we would likely find that person eligible for benefits after the period in which they would, you know, need to quarantine. Once they become able to work again, we would likely deem that person eligible and, and able to receive benefits. So it's really going to depend on whether or not there has been a separation if it's just somebody having to stay home with the intention of going back to work and they're out of sick leave, for example, to cover that time period, we, we would likely not uh, allow them benefits in that instance because they wouldn't meet the eligibility requirements for unemployment. I hope that answers your question, Mr. Chair. Well, it's a complicated area. Uh, yes, is sir. That, is that different than what our law, law provided when we did the temporary fix 
last year as far as temporary separations where they where they they're not they're able to eventually mm -hmm. go back to work do we make any provision for people who were not uh given their job uh or promised their job back uh, yes, sir. There were some expanded eligibility provisions that went into place during the height of the pandemic, primarily to allow people who needed to separate from employment for an extensive period due to a quarantine or taking care of a health care member, um, you know, who was out of work or needing to take care of children who, uh, you know, because of a school closure or remote work or something to that event. We also had the PUA program at that time, which was designed to assist those individuals as well if they were not eligible for unemployment. Uh, a lot of those flexibilities across the country at the federal level and also the expanded provisions that were put in place in Vermont have, have since expired. So at this point, we are back to traditional unemployment insurance program, which would not allow for, for similar exemptions. Are you, get, are you getting some inquiries from people who have come down with COVID and saying, you know, I can't afford to live. I need some help financially. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't, you know, I either, maybe I'll have my job back, maybe or not. I don't know how long I'm gonna have to be out, but common sense and even CDC guidelines may dictate that they stay away from work or they have childcare, mm -hmm. school closes down and they have to stay home. Uh, I'm, I'm having, I mean, the commissioner gave us a bunch of, uh, uh, examples, and I think they're all accurate, but I'm not sure I come to the same conclusion that it's it's much different this time around than mm -hmm. last time around, um, and whether we should be helping these people. Um, you know, I would say, you know, I've received some questions, mainly from employers, not necessarily from claimants. Uh, like yesterday on the webinar that we did, there were a few questions about this issue uh, that we answered for employers that were on the call. Uh, I would say we haven't seen a significant increase in claims being filed. I mean, you know, typically claimants don't proactively reach out to us and ask whether they would be eligible. And our, 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 our typical response, even when they do, is, you know, you have the right to file. It's hard for us to gauge your eligibility without having all of the information available to us. So we try to be very cautious about not uh, being firm on whether somebody would be eligible for their circumstance because, you know, there could be a different party to the dispute, the employer, we don't have that information. So we try to be careful of not advising people that they will be eligible, but uh, I'm not aware of a lot of claimants reaching out to us about this issue. And I also know we have not seen uh, any spike in UI claims related to this topic. We haven't seen adjudications going up related to this topic in particular, no, sir. So is this, um, I mean, if I got sick, uh, that I had to go out of work for a month or something and my employer laid me off, uh, I thought there was a, a disqualification period, but then that could, you could still get benefits. And I think in this case, you said, you didn't mention any disqualification period. You said that in that case, we probably award benefits. Uh, so your, your disqualification is going to be, it's very similar to what you just described, Mr. Chair. So for, for everyone's benefit who may be listening, you know, if somebody separates for employment due to some medical circumstance that prohibits them from continuing to work, they would not be eligible for unemployment based on that medical separation, because at that point in time, again, you would not be you know, available to work, which is a requirement of UI. But once that period, once your medical disqualification is lifted, then we would look at that separation and determine whether or not you would be eligible at that time. So let's say, you know, you, you, you know, you broke your leg and you can't work and your employer discharges you, you know, at the point in time when you can go back to work. And that's not a great example, to be honest, people may be able to work with a broken leg. But the point being, you know, at the point in time when you're clear to go back to work and you're now able to work again at that point in time, 
you would become eligible for unemployment based on the separation. And that's where I was describing, Mr. Chair, in a COVID situation, if you are discharged, you know, if your employer, you know, terminates you because of a COVID related separation, you may not be eligible for unemployment during that period when you have COVID if you are ill or during the period of quarantine. But once that period is lifted or once you have recovered, at that point in time, we would look at the separation. And if it was an eligible separation and you were able to go back to work, we would allow benefits in that instance. I guess, uh, um, I guess maybe I misunderstood the way the law is. I thought that if you quit for health reasons presently, it's as you said, but there's also some period of disqualification, even when you're able to go back to work, like a week or, or something like that, uh, up, the, up to six weeks or something. Yes, you, sir. Let me double check. I believe you are correct. But you know, the, the point being, once you're, uh, let me confirm while we're sitting here talking with the committee, but you know, once the, the big question is your, your availability of work. And once that has been resolved, you could then potentially be eligible for benefits. I'll confirm on the, the medical um, disqualification. Okay. Senator out collection. Well, it, it, this is sort of, it's frustrating, uh, obviously, because here we are in a, in, in a surge again, we had one obviously this fall and we managed to get through Delta without UI clearly being impacted as we're now again at record lows of unemployment claims. But I guess my concern is what are people doing, you know, even if they're out and their employer's okay with it, what are they doing about income? Um, and I, 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 that, I guess that concerns me. If they're out for two or three weeks, that's a huge economic burden on them and what... What's our remedy for that? Is there one? And be, with no paid family leave, with nothing safe, with no safety net for people, what are we doing about that? So I, I'll yeah. jump in here, if you don't mind. I, I think the question really becomes, is the unemployment insurance program or the unemployment insurance trust fund the appropriate place for that? And I don't think it is personally, um, it, because it is a health uh, separation and a health reason for not being able to work. Um, and so what ends up happening is we start um, uh, creating workarounds for regular eligibility requirements that typically would mean someone isn't eligible. So if someone, to Cameron's point, if someone has to leave work due to a medical condition, um, they would not be eligible uh, for unemployment insurance. Uh, in normal times. Um, so, so then, Michael, is it a, a workers' comp issue that we should be looking at? I mean, uh, you know what? It, you know, we certainly looked at health concerns at the beginning of COVID, and we instate we instated. You know, we we put into play and into place measures to support workers who had to leave because of COVID. So we've dealt with health issues already with UI and set a precedent for that. Um, so. I guess my question is, does this belong in the workers' comp? Should we be make then making these workers eligible to access workers' comp more readily? So, or yeah, to you, I think those are great questions. Um, first of all, I think the the hard part will be trying to compare today to 2020 um, when we had things like an emergency order where there were certain federal exemptions and exceptions and federal programs uh, that many of these people would have been eligible for. Um, so many of these people became eligible and moved into the PUA program uh, based on right. their eligibility. Um, I think to your point, you are talking more about a, um, you know, a family or medical leave program, which does not currently exist. And I think that's the, the challenge. When we talk about workers' compensation, the only way an individual becomes eligible for workers' compensation is if you can directly tie back the injury or the reason for separation to the workplace. Um, and, and unfortunately, as we know, it may well be. It, it may well be, but again, you have to, the employee, um, the burden is on the employee to um, prove uh, that the exposure and subsequent, um, you know, uh, consequence of that, uh, that put them out of work was right. um, but, through working. But there, 
I, I'm just astonished we, you aren't getting that pressure right now from restaurant, particularly the lodging and hospitality sector, where there, you know, our our workers in particularly in restaurants are 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 exposed all the time by the tourists by who are bringing it in or by our own unvaccinated or by by people who've gotten it. I mean, you know, it's yeah, but the, and I think the difference, though, um, is that the, with the change in the CDC guidance. Right. So there's no, oh, um, right. you know, but even if you're vaccinated and you are exposed, you don't need to quarantine or isolate anymore. And so part of that, too, is with 80 plus percent of our population fully vaccinated, um, if they are a close contact or fall into the exposure category, they no longer, unless they're, um, you know, ex exuding symptoms, they don't need to quarantine anymore. So the, the level of the number of people needing right. to quarantine no. is much less. Uh, I also I, think, in, uh, go ahead. No, um, no, I, I get it. But I also get that a thoughtful person uh, you know, it's still unclear to me how contagious you are in, in, in that circumstance. I mean, I know there is CDC, CDC guidelines on this now. Uh, I just I just I'm concerned about people who are, you know, without paid family leave and without UI. Are we left with workers comp to pick up the week or so that people may have to not be working? And so for but people have, for yeah. whom every dollar counts. And every week of work counts. What are we going to do to help these people? So it, to Cameron's point, I think what we aren't seeing right now is a massive number of people yeah. filing for unemployment. So I think it's also hard to know exactly who is impacted and, and how are they impacted. Um, right. Because we aren't seeing a significant number of, uh, you know, what we saw right now is even a much smaller uptick than we normally see during our winter session. So even um, those um, construction employers or granite shed workers that typically lay off hundreds of Vermonters um, actually are, there's such a demand uh, right now that they're actually keeping them on uh, through the winter to do other projects um, so again, even the seasonal unemployment isn't as steep as it used to be, um, at least this year. Let me let, let me interrupt because we'd like to take a break at ten o'clock. Um, I'm just gonna uh, we're gonna continue with this conversation because I think it's an, I think it's really important. Um, uh, I, I'm not surprised that there's not that many people applying. Uh, I mean, we're in a different environment. I mean. With the emergency order, there were a lot of businesses that were shut down and people thought about, you know, the expectation I should get unemployment if my business closed. But here the businesses are operating and they lose income for a couple of weeks and they probably don't even think necessarily of unemployment, but they need some income. So we need to talk about that. And I also want to, Commissioner, come back to workers' comp because I had on a much smaller scale, I had the same question in terms of the presumption law we passed last year and continued. Uh, it's very hard to prove with airborne diseases that it was COVID, that, uh, that it was caught at work, uh, but a lot of these things are gonna be caught at work. So let's take a 10 minute break. Scott's been great uh, to remind me about that because I could go on and on, you know. So we'll come back at uh, uh, 11.